Good evening, everyone. Uh, that was probably the best Dharma talk I ever gave, but I'll follow up with uh, a lesser Dharma talk. Uh, so in the New York area right now, we're having an unseasonably warm day. And uh, I didn't plan it out that way, but my talk uh, today uh, involves using a fan and uh, cooling oneself, uh, refreshing oneself. And uh, I thought I would uh, start uh, my fan talk uh, with a consideration of air, which of course uh, we need to fan ourselves with. And uh, I was reading a uh, uh, an essay on uh, economics recently, and uh, the essay dealt with uh, something called a public good, as defined by the economics uh, profession, uh, and apparently. Uh, uh, academic economics uh, defines a public good as something uh, something that's good uh, and that is non-rivalrous and non-excludable, which uh, basically means in English, uh, we don't compete for the use of a public good, a true public good. In other words, my use of the public good doesn't interfere with yours. And also, uh, uh, the public good is available to everyone. Uh, no one can fence it off and charge uh, people for using it. And so I thought a great example of a public good uh, as involved in this definition was air, clean air, uh, which we all use. Uh, and uh, the cleaner the air is, uh, the more everyone benefits. Uh, my use of the air does not interfere with your use of the air. And uh, Fortunately, no one's figured out a, a way to make a buck out of air. Uh, some people have figured out how to make a buck out of water, uh, but uh, in terms of air, it's available to all. It's non-excludable. Uh, and of course, uh, I thought of this uh, in terms of uh, the Buddha Dharma, our Buddha, our Buddha nature, uh, which in some ways also meets the definition of a public good. Uh, uh, it's available to all, everyone has the use of it. No one is excluded from it, no one is left out. And uh, I can't say I have it and I'm going to sell it to you. Uh, so uh, Buddha air is often uh, used, not surprisingly, uh, as a metaphor for Buddha or true nature uh, for fundamental reality. Uh, and the thing about air is, uh, we're not usually aware of it unless there's something wrong with it. If it's clear and pure, uh, we don't go around saying, oh, this is clear, pure air. Uh, we just breathe. Uh, so in order uh, for us to appreciate uh, for the clear, pure air to be manifest, we, we have to do something with it. We have to uh, expand our diaphragms and contract them. 
uh, and thus the air through our moment by moment effort is manifested as our life. Uh, the same applies uh, to Buddha Dharma. Uh, it, it's is a public good, but it's not manifest until it's used. And of course, on a hot day like today in New York, uh, we can use the energy that breathing the air is giving us to fan ourselves, to generate a cool breeze, to cool us off. So air is often used as a metaphor and fanning is used as a metaphor. So air is a metaphor for our true nature, but fanning is a metaphor for the actualization of our true nature, for using it. Our true nature by itself doesn't do anything for anyone. It's only when it's actualized that we appreciate its nourishing and healing power. So when we uh, have the Shusa ceremony, uh, as we will do uh, this summer, one of the very first things that happens off stage in the Shuso ceremony is the teacher presents the Shuso with a fan. There you go, the fan is in your hands. And now it's up to you to use it skillfully to generate the wind of the Dharma to refresh the Sangha. And in the koans, uh, a similar use is made of this metaphor. Now, there was a, an old fellow named Yen Kwan who said to his attendant, bring me my rhinoceros horn fan. The attendant said, the fan is broken. And Yen Kwan said, if the fan is broken, then bring me the rhinoceros. The attendant had no reply. So what's going on in this dialogue? Bring me my rhinoceros horn fan. The fan is broken. If we treat the fan as a metaphor for our empty nature, we can see why the fan is broken. It has no essence of its own. Uh, our nature manifests, manifests itself through moment by moment change. There's nothing to grab onto. There's nothing to attain. There's no platform called enlightenment to step off on and say, ah, I've arrived. The fan weren't broken. If it were, had an eternal essence, then you could say, ah, God, I got the fan done. But no. It's a broken fan. Just like all of us are broken in various ways, just as our brokenness allows us to begin the process of healing ourselves and others. We're all Buddhas on the way to becoming Buddha. We're all works in progress, we are all simply this broken fan. 
but it's not a matter of just uh, uh, sitting up and saying, oh yeah, I'm a broken fan, right? That's not what uh, Master Yan Quan is asking from us through his request to the attendant. He's saying, well, if the fan is broken, then bring me the rhinoceros. Life. Uh, the rhinoceros uh, is an unusual uh, metaphor in this case. Uh, usually uh, it's an ox uh, or a water buffalo sometimes. Bring me the rhinoceros. Use this ability that you inherently have. Use your fundamental nature. Bring it to me. Show me some life. How would you answer Master Yan Quan's challenge? There are a number of uh, masters who uh, commented on this koan and uh, really they brought up uh, the kind of hangups that keep us from using the fan freely. Uh, so one guy, uh, Su, Su Fu, said, I don't refuse to bring it out for you, but I fear the horn would be imperfect. I think we can all identify with this kind of brokenness, right? Yes, uh, um, I, I would I would like to do this, that, or the other thing, uh, but I'm going to wait until all the ducks are lined up in a row. I know exactly what I'm doing before I take a step. In such a way, we go round and round and round in our heads. Uh, uh, matching ourselves up to some non-existent idea of perfection. We don't take a step, we become paralyzed like the attendant. I feel the fear of the horn would be imperfect. And Master Sueto commenting on this said, I want an imperfect horn. I want to see what you got just as you are. I want you to manifest the fundamental truth of Buddhism just as you are, not at some perfect stuffed shirt, but in all your brokenness on the way to healing, in all your being Buddha on the way to becoming Buddha. Now the next guy says, uh, I fear if I give it to you, then I won't have it. Now this is uh, something also that we can all recognize. Uh, I'm, I'm doing enough. If, if I do any more, I'm gonna tire myself out. I'm gonna burn out. I don't have any more to give. But the breeze generated by this fan is boundless. It's inexhaustible. That doesn't mean we don't need to rest. But there's always a way we can give. There's always a way we can share, even if it's just with a nod or a smile. We don't have to be paralyzed by the attendant because we're exhausted. Right from our exhaustion, we can say a turning word. The next guy, Su Fu, drew a circle and wrote the word rhino in it. 
Now the circle uh, in uh, some schools of Zen is uh, used as a symbol for Buddha. So this is a way of saying the rhino is Buddha. Uh, for some reason in the book of Serenity, uh, Master Wan's song in his commentary thinks this is a very fine answer, uh, but not so in the Blue Cliff Record. Uh, the Blue Cliff Records commentary uh, is that this is a stagnant response. This is, uh, you know, the beginner who says, oh, well, I'm perfect and complete just as I am. I don't need to do anything. I, why well, I bother to brush off my cushion? Why well, bother to sit still during Zazen? Why well, bother to even clean the Zendo? Crack open a six pack and throw the beer cans on the floor. It's perfect and complete, just as it is. And it's true. You'll be sitting in the middle of a littered, shitty looking Zendo. That is perfect and complete as a littered, shitty looking Zendo. I guess it depends what you want. Uh, that's one reason we uh, take vows, right? Uh, we do the four vows as a way of orienting ourselves to the way we want to be in the world. A way that saves all beings. A way in which we fearlessly enter all the Dharma gates and vowed to master them. A way to attain the unattainable by realizing there's no permanent or fixed thing to hold on to. In other words, to realize the pure air a fundamental nature requires on remitting effort, just like to make use of clear, pure air requires that you expand and contract your diaphragm ceaselessly. Or in this case, if you want to cool yourself off and the air conditioning doesn't happen to be available, then you might want to use an old fashioned fan. Now, as I'm talking about this business of fan and fanning, uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with Dogen know that he wound up his uh, great uh, teaching on uh, the koan of everyday life, Genjo koan, actualizing the way, using the air. He wound it up with a very similar image. And he talked about uh, Master Mayu, who was sitting on his porch, fanning himself. And a student came along and said, Master, Master, the nature of wind is permanent. And there is no place it does not reach. Why are you fanning yourself? And the master said, you only understand that the nature of wind is permanent. You don't understand there's nowhere it does not reach. The monk said, what is the meaning of nowhere it does not reach? And the master
and Dogen uh, commenting on this manda said, the actual actualization of Buddha Dharma and the transmission of the path, the vital transmission of the path, key word vital, the actualization of Buddha Dharma and the vital transmission of the path are like this. If you say that you don't need to fan yourself because the nature of wind is permanent or that you can have wind without fanning, you understand neither permanence nor the nature of wind. You understand neither permanence nor the nation, nature of wind. You understand neither the eternal nor the ephemeral. You don't understand the interpenetration of the eternal with the everyday moment to moment of the ephemeral. You don't understand permanence in the midst of constant change. So he says, you understand neither permanence nor the nature of wind. Because the nature of wind is permanent, the wind of the Buddha house brings forth the gold of the earth and ripens the cream of the long river. It is this fanning, this constant effort without expectation that saves all beings, that saves us, that actualizes our fundamental nature. So, it turns out that whether we brush off our cushions at the end of Zazen, whether we clean the Zendo, whether we respond to people kindly rather than aggression, it affects the whole thing. It is true that Things are perfect and complete just as they are. The air is always the air. We can choose to pollute it. We can choose to purify it. As Buddhists, our vow is to realize the purity of the air the purity and perfection of our fundamental nature through constant practice, through constant effort. We vow each in our own way to bring forth the gold of the earth and to ripen the cream of the long river.